Welcome to this podcast from the Marxist Workers' Party. A party that is organizing to arm workers, trade union members and young people with Marxist ideas and analysis. Such ideas are an indispensable weapon to help guide the struggles against unemployment, poverty pay and inequality, and for a socialist society. In this podcast, as 2019 closes and 2020 begins, we draw a balance sheet on the past 12 months of the class struggle worldwide and look ahead to what 2020 will bring for the struggles of the South African working class. So I'm joined today by Wiseman Hamilton, the General Secretary of the Marxist Workers' Party. So 2019 was a tumultuous year worldwide. How would you summarise the events of the past year? I would say that uh, 2019 represents the beginning of the process of the closing of the scissors between the consciousness of the masses and the objective conditions that Trotsky spoke about. It's over 40 years in reality that uh, neoliberalism uh, has been the order of the day so far as economic policies are concerned with devastating consequences for the working class worldwide. And if one has to pick amongst all the rebellions that are now characterizing the globe, uh, and that includes the developments that are taking place in uh, Bolivia, uh, in Brazil, in Argentina, Chile, the Lebanon, Iraq, uh, on the African continent, Algeria, the Sudan, the beginnings of a new movement uh, in Egypt. If one has to single out from the point of view of its ideological significance, I think it would have to be Chile. And the reason I would make that argument is that the first laboratory experiment of neoliberalism was carried out in the most brutal and barbaric fashion by the Chile, uh, the dictatorship that emerged following the overthrow of Allende uh, by Pinochet, because the economic policies that followed were a textbook uh, example of the kind of policies uh, uh, put forward by the so-called Chicago boys, uh, the school of monetarism that was based in the United States. And the working class paid a heavy price in the first instance for such a regime to be put in place to begin with, uh, with over 10,000 disappeared, possibly as many as 20,000 killed. And the heads of the Chilean working class have been down uh, for decades. But there has been a recovery. Uh, and it is astonishing to listen to some of the participants in these demonstrators reflecting the clarity of understanding of the uh, the polarization between the classes, that it is the mass of the population led by the working class up against a rapacious and brutal capitalist elite. Um, but I think that the same process that has brought the Chilean masses into rebellion against the economic and increasingly uh, and very rapidly also the political uh, order is reflected in other struggles. Another very good example of how it is the working class that has the best capacity to overcome the divisions that have been imposed by the various competing elites is what is happening in the Lebanon, where uh, people formed a symbolic chain right across the country, irrespective of the religious and sectarian divisions into which the ruling elite has forced, has kettled in reality, the, uh, the Lebanese masses. There is a recovery also from the blow that was suffered from a, the revolution in Egypt that brought down the Mubarak dictatorship. But because of the absence of a mass workers party, 
with a clear revolutionary program and a steel leadership uh, allowed the capitalist system to survive and for that brutal regime to reassert itself in an even worse form than the Mubarak dictatorship itself. From that too, there is now a recovery. And it is interesting to look at the kind of comments that are coming from countries like the Sudan, uh, Algeria, that the lessons of what has happened uh, in Egypt are beginning to be learned, but it is only the beginning of the process. But everywhere now, it is, it is clear that the working class is putting itself at the forefront of the struggle uh, to overcome the, uh, the disastrous legacy of neoliberal capitalism. It's an enormous, uh, 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 enormously significant turn of events on a worldwide basis. And in view of the fact that capitalism has no solution to the problems, all the ingredients that prepared the social upheaval is continuing to be stored up and it will be a period of tumult, of explosive developments uh, and of struggle on the part of the working class in the course of which clarity and greater clarity will be achieved. And of course, in South Africa itself, 2019 ended in dramatic fashion with the week-long strike at South African Airways. Now, the Marxist Workers' Party has pointed out that this battle opened a new phase in the class struggle. Wiseman, why is that? And how does the MWP view the outcome of the SAA strike? The SAA strike was uh, an important uh, indication of the, the meeting uh, on the battlefield of the working class on the one hand and the capitalist class uh, and their political managers in the form of the ANC on the other. It is a prelude, I think, this battle to the much greater battles that are going to unfold, uh, particularly as, as, at ESCOM, but also in the public sector broadly. It is clear from all the propaganda uh, of the capitalist press that the question of the public sector wage bill um, is at the center of what they believe the government's strategy should be going forward as far as overcoming the fiscal crisis as the country hurtles towards uh, a fiscal cliff and all the other crises uh, that are building up at the same time. The SAA strike was significant in that it sounded the first uh, battle cry uh, of the working class, but not only for that reason. There was also uh, a, a very important other aspect to it, and that is that you had uh, the traditional, if you like, militant union, NUMSA, uh, in the forefront but there was absolutely no hesitation in making common calls with the, the South African Cabin Crew Association, uh, an, an unaffiliated uh, union with uh, uh, no real history of struggle and for whom this experience would have been the first in the, uh, in the class battle. And the fact that an alliance was formed between SAA and SACA is... Uh, a very important pointer to the manner in which battles are going to be fought and the kind of strategy that is going to be needed to overcome the divisions that exist between the various uh, sectors of the working class. So we believe that the SAA strike was a victory, but a victory in a battle and not in the war. And the capitalist class is seething with resentment that the workers in the end achieved the wage demand uh, that they had gone out on strike for and are now readying themselves as the SAA business rescue plan uh, indicates to try and claw back all those gains and to push through the original intention, which was actually to, uh, uh, to place SAA in a position where it could actually be sold off. You mentioned two very key points uh, in that answer. 
um, and I want to take them in turn. Firstly, you mentioned the public sector wage bill and the situation at ESCOM in particular. So all eyes are going to be on the ANC's February budget. Um, can you expand a bit more and explain what the MWP expects to come out of that budget? Well, the ANC government has been under a relentless pressure uh, from the rating agencies, uh, the instruments and police of global capital, as well as big business in South Africa, to reduce public spending as the way in which to, uh, to close the, uh, the budget deficit. In other words, to place the burden for the uh, fiscal crisis directly onto the shoulders of the, uh, of the working class. The demand, uh, the consensus uh, uh, indicates amongst capitalist commentators is that the public sector is overblown um, by at least 30,000 workers. So 30,000 jobs must go. Uh, the latest indications are that they will be going into the February budget with a proposal for a wage freeze. They are already carrying out, uh, before the real battle commences, what are in effect guerrilla attacks uh, on the workers, not filling posts. There are over 200,000 vacancies in the public sector. Uh, they're not filling those posts. So... Uh, as people retire or resign, those posts are not being filled. So they're carrying through their program uh, by stealth in the meantime. But what they are required to do, and that is the pressure that has been exerted on them by big business, is to put a clear plan in place by the February budget to reduce public spending by over 300 billion rand over the, uh, over the next three years. The interpretation that has been placed on the report by Moody's rating agencies, the biggest and the last of the three that hasn't got South Africa's uh, a credit rating uh, on, on junk status yet, is that he's got three months to, uh, uh, he has a three months final written warning that by February, uh, he must have a plan in place to carry through those cuts, reduce the public sector workforce, restructure, the uh, SOE, state-owned enterprises. And uh, the SAA business rescue is, in fact, a kind of sacrificial lamb uh, offering to the, uh, to the rating agencies and, and big businesses in that regard, but he needs to carry through much more. That is what is being demanded. So it sets the scene for an almighty, an almighty collision between the public sector workers and the uh, and the government and the capitalist class uh, behind it. If he carries through, if if the government fails to come through with the budget cuts demanded, it is very likely that Moody's will downgrade the South African economy uh, to junk status. And I think that that is where they take their marching orders from this government. And therefore, I think we should uh, prepare ourselves for such a budget, an austerity budget, that will in fact amount to a declaration of war on the working class of this country. You mentioned the unity of NUMSA and the South African Cabin Crew Association in the recent SAA strike. Also at ESCOM, NUMSA and the NUM have announced a joint program of action, including a march to Megawatt Park uh, early in January to welcome the new CEO. Um, given what had been intense rivalry between these unions until now, what do you believe this indicates about the future? Well, first of all, we welcome the, uh, uh, the decisions of the Joint Shop Stewards Council to organise a programme of mass action uh, on the question of ESCOM in particular. And again, uh, we think that this is another step forward, building on what, uh, on how the SAA strike was conducted. Uh, but I think we should also uh, point out that they need to look back on other sectors of workers that could have been brought in to the SAA strike and consider what other forces they are going to need in the battle against ESCOM uh, going forward. But we think that what this indicates 
is that the pressure of the rank and file in both unions have forced the leadership on both sides to uh, set aside their own uh, bureaucratic uh, interests and the rivalries, rivalries that ensued therefrom um, in order to achieve the maximum unity in the struggle that is now going to be required because this is going to be a huge battle. Uh, uh, ESCOM is at the center of the economic crisis and so far as the ruling class is concerned, is also at the center of the political crisis because what they want to see from an ANC government is a willing, willingness to stare down the unions and to carry through the, uh, the plans for the restructuring uh, of ESCOM to give the private sector uh, an, e uh, an even better opportunity to sink their teeth uh, into this entity uh, that they have, by their disastrous policies, uh, put to the point, uh, brought to the point where we could possibly even have a complete breakdown of the grid that would take three months to recover from. It's an absolute catastrophe, potentially, that lies ahead. And therefore, this battle is in reality a battle for the determination of which class has the policies to lead the country out of the economic crisis, the capitalist class and their political mandarins in the ANC, or the working class, ultimately through a party that it needs to create in order to provide the whole of society with an alternative way forward. And what would you say to workers who are sceptical um, about such cooperation, given the announcement by Kasatu that they would support partial privatization of non-strategic SOEs? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, to comment on Kosato's position, many might believe that this is, in fact, a fundamental departure from the position that Kosato uh, previously had. Uh, that's a mistake. As long ago as 1996, the year in, uh, when GEAR was adopted, the Kosato leadership prepared to align itself in reality to the political imperatives of the ANC government uh, with whom they were and still remain uh, in, a, in the tripartite alliance where the responsibility of the Kosato leadership in reality is to police their own members um, and to persuade them to accept the, uh, the neoliberal capitalist direction of ANC economic policy. In 1996, at the Central Executive Committee, they identified the transport sector as one of the non-negotiables as far as privatization and or restructuring is concerned. What is important about this is that there's an attempt on the part of the Kosato leadership to uh, repudiate the position that they took uh, in 1996, although the position that they are now currently taking was inherent in the kind of distinction that they were making between the different sectors of the economy, economy that it was okay to consider privatization because they're allegedly strategic. So it's a repudiation of the 1996 position under the, uh, the pretext that uh, the airlines are somehow uh, not part of the strategic sector, the transport as a whole, uh, was according to the way they defined it in uh, in 1996. We, by the way, uh, consider it disgusting that the Kusatu leadership should approach this question as if air travel is not for the working class, that what they should be confined to are taxis, trains that break down frequently, and even the hundreds of thousands of school children that have to walk up to 12 kilometers a day just to get to school. All of that uh, is part of transport as far as we are concerned. And the working class has as much right to participate, I mean, to have access to free and affordable and quality public transport uh, uh, in the air as they have uh, on the ground. Now, I think that the, the, uh, uh, the fact that NUMSA and NUM are going to go together uh, in this struggle uh, on, the, uh, on the ESCOM issue is an, an excellent pointer of the direction in which developments should go. Now, part of the reason that COSATU has remained in existence, even though uh, SAFTU 
was brought into existence as a result of an expression of a desire by the workers to return the Trade Union Federation to the militant socialist roots that, uh, on, on which it was built in the beginning. Kosatu has not, uh, the Kosatu workers have not yet uh, come over because of the ambiguous signals that have come, unfortunately, from the Saftu leadership itself. Um, we think it is time for that ambiguity within the Saftu leadership to be completely clarified uh, on all these uh, questions. And on that basis, uh, put forward a program of action that will encourage the Kosatu members to join forces with Saftu in the struggle uh, that is necessary against the capitalist policies of the uh, of the ANC government. And therefore, a direct appeal should be made to the Kosatu members to participate in all the various programs of mass action that, uh, that Saftu has called for, including the series of general strikes uh, that they've indicated will be, will be part of the program for, for 2020. That will put the Kosatu leadership to a test and expose much more clearly, on the one hand, the role of their own leaders to their own members, but it will also give an important signal to the Kosatu members about the seriousness of the Saftu leadership itself. And therefore, the tactic of the United Front uh, of uh, um, making an appeal to participate in joint action is exactly what, the what, what, what these conditions call for. So the Marxist Workers' Party sees a trade union united front as the way forward uh, in the struggles ahead. Can you expand more on what that would look like? I think there are many lessons to be learned from the manner in which Kosatu itself was built. Uh, an important uh, attraction for workers was the fact that the leaders of the different trade union formations that came together to form Kosatu set aside the, the narrow interests of their own union bureaucracies and engaged in joint struggle. And this was expressed organizationally in the establishment of industrial locals, not only for the purposes, by the way, of uniting workers irrespective of their trade union affiliations at the time, but also to enable the organized workers to form an organized link with communities. Because what was an important feature of the consciousness of the Kosatu uh, uh, workers at that time was a recognition of the inseparable link between the struggle in the workplace and the struggle in, uh, in working class communities. So that working class communities could participate uh, in these events. And a return to that approach to struggle is now an absolute necessity, particularly in the face of the propaganda that all the trade unions uh, are interested in uh, protecting the so-called privileges of the of those workers fortunate enough to have a job at the expense of those who are unemployed. It is necessary to emphasize and re-emphasize the point that the, uh, the, the link between the struggles in the communities um, and, and that of the uh, organized workers in the workplace must be at the forefront now in order to overcome, first of all, the propaganda, but more importantly, to provide the movement to the strength that such unity uh, will provide it in the battles that lie ahead. And a movement of that character, what kind of program would it need to be armed with? It is important that the approach to the struggle um, must be taken um, on the basis that whilst the primary responsibilities of the trade unions is to protect jobs, wages, and conditions, that they address the question of what the cause of the crisis is in the first place. And what we have is a perfect storm developing here between the incapacity of the capitalist system in South Africa to meet even the ba basic needs of the working class, the obvious determination of the established capitalist class to uh, maintain 
the order that was put in place, particularly since care, but uh, for which the way had been prepared by the abandonment of the Freedom Charter and the brief flotation of the R RDP um, after, after 1994. Um, and the interest also of the political ruling elite, because what 1994 ushered in was a marriage between the class interests of the established capitalist class and the class interests of the new political elite led by the ANC itself, who far from wanting to overthrow capitalism, wanted to be absorbed uh, into that system. And in circumstances where internationally neoliberalism had a, uh, uh, a tight grip on macroeconomic policy across, across the globe, the manner in which the ANC leadership originally envisaged they would be able to fulfill, fulfill their class interests, that is, to emulate the model of the Nationalist Party that came to, 19, to power in 1948 and use the state in order to create an Afrikaner capitalist class. Uh, they wanted to emulate that model and to create a black capitalist class. That way was barred by the fact that uh, the intervention of the state in the economy was now anathema. What was left for the ANC ruling political elite is to leech onto the state. And that is why you will find uh, their uh, fangs have penetrated all the SOEs. And this has enormously aggravated the crisis that capitalism was facing uh, in any event uh, and uh, created the crisis that we uh, are faced with now. So the uh, the problem clearly is that the program that has been pursued by the ANC since 1996 for both political and class, uh, uh, for the fulfillment of their own class interests and those of the capitalist class have now uh, come into open collision. And the question that is, with that of the working class, and the question that is posed is how the economy can uh, be taken out of this crisis. It is clear that um, what needs to be posed as an alternative to what the ANC government and the capitalist class as a whole is putting forward is the taking over of the commanding heights of the economy by the working class itself uh, through the nationalization of the banks, the mines, the factories, and so on and so forth. And you see, one of the uh, things that we as socialists have to address is that uh, our ideas are always dismissed as utopian. In fact, what is utopian is what is being proposed by the capitalist class itself, because inherent in what they are proposing is an even deeper uh, deepening of the crisis that the economy is actually failing, uh, facing, so that the working class must put forward proposals for the takeover, for example, of SAA. Um, for nationalization under workers' control, because to the extent that the SOEs have remained under state control, they've been run as capitalist enterprises, and there has been no worker control involved in it whatsoever. The same thing applies to ESCOM and all the uh, other SOEs. And we would put forward the formula of representation by the workers in the industry, by the broader labor movement, and by communities affected by these services across the board. The precise uh, um, uh, components of the, of the formula can be left to experience to refine. But what is important is that the interests of the working class must clearly be counterposed in the manner in which these enterprises are run to that of the capitalist class who want to run them into the ground for the sake of profit. You mentioned the utopianism of the capitalist classes policy positions to deal with the economic crisis. And you've also mentioned uh, the threat of the Moody's downgrade. Can we just deal with that briefly? Um, what would be the consequences for the working class of a Moody's downgrade? And do you think it's likely? On the basis of the direction in which the ANC government is going, um, with every effort, being made to avoid uh, a downgrade, and that is why they've taken the action in relation to SOEs. Um, 
we cannot say with absolute certainty uh, whether this would satiate the appetite of, uh, of Moody's, uh, of the kind of signal of intent that they are demanding from the ANC. Uh, but I think it would be irresponsible for the labor movement not to prepare itself for the possibility that such a downgrade may well take place. And it would be like-minded to say, as many uh, leaders on, on the left are saying, well, the working class is living in junk anyway, so what difference does it make? Uh, that would disarm the working class and leave it completely unprepared for the consequences that will follow. Because what would a downgrade mean? It would mean that a government whose finances depend on borrowing 850 million rand every single working day uh, would now have to pay uh, extortionate rates of interest on the loans that they have to make on the world financial markets to plug the budget deficit. Um, the consequence of a downgrade would mean that South Africa would be kicked out of the uh, FTSE World Bond Index because investors are not allowed to keep their investments in a country that has been downgraded to junk. The, the, the consequence would be that whoever South Africa from that point onwards would have to, would borrow, uh, would be obliged to borrow from, would charge even higher rates. That in turn, in circumstances where interest on the servicing of government debt is already the highest uh, item, that even more resources otherwise, uh, uh, dedicated to the provision of service delivery would have to be diverted in order to service the debt. There would also be capital flight. Uh, the estimates vary. They, they can't know for certain themselves, but it could be as high as 150, 200, maybe even 3 billion rand of capital flight. If that were to happen, it would be put uh, irresistible pressure on the rand. Uh, it would decline precipitately and the traditional instrument used by the Reserve Bank to, to prop up the RAND will come into force. And they will, they could raise interest rates to extortionate levels. Uh, it could even go up as high to 15, 20% compared to where it is now. And that would place an intolerable burden on debt servicing by ordinary consumers. There are 19 million people that are credit active inside the country, 10 million of whom are in arrears uh, uh, by up to three months. There would be defaults on debt. The companies that they owe money to could go into liquidation. There would be an enormous escalation of, uh, of, uh, of retrenchments. And under those circumstances, the little patience that is left amongst the masses in a country where in any event, we have the highest um, number of protests per head of, uh, of population would snap. Uh, it would throw people into uh, uh, circumstances that compel them even to raid supermarkets just to feed themselves, where 50 million people already go to bed uh, uh, hungry uh, every night. Um, it would, in other words, if we are unprepared, uh, prevent the labor movement and the organized workers from placing themselves in the forefront of the struggle that will ensue and give you the necessary direction to challenge not only the ANC government, but the capitalist policies on which this ANC government has been ruling and pose before society the question of who should rule society, the working class or the capitalist class. And therefore it is necessary to build such a possibility into the perspectives in any event, uh, because this would be the worst case scenario. So as to conclude, as I say, we will have to wait and see where the Moody's are happy with the steps that have been taken as far as SA is concerned and the further steps that might ensue so far as, uh, as ESCOM is concerned uh, and the proposed uh, unbundling of uh, generation distribution, uh, et cetera, uh, whether that will hold it off. But irrespective, irrespective of whether Moody's uh, takes that step, such a program is in any event necessary for the working class to put forward at the forefront of which has to be 
the nationalization of the commanding rights of the economy under the democratic control and management of the working class. So nationalization would be key. What other socialist policies could help protect the working class in the event of a downgrade? Well, once the, 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 the idea of the nationalization of the commanding rights of the economy uh, under workers' control is accepted, so too uh, would be the policies that must necessarily follow. Because the, work, the capitalist class is not going to sit back and applaud the actions uh, that could be forced on the existing government, which is very unlikely, or one that would be implemented by uh, a workers' government created by the uh, organized workers themselves because there will be attempts at sabotage um, to at capital flight um, we already see by the way the extent to which uh, capital is being moved offshore by the capitalists themselves uh, in anticipation of a possible downgrade uh, by moody's or alternatively the implementation of the kind of policies that have been adapted adopted by the ANC conference at Nazrek, expropriation of land without uh, compensation and the nationalization of the, of the Reserve Bank. A government that comes to power on the basis of the program that we are proposing would be obliged to exert control over the movement of capital. There will have to be capital controls. There would have to be price controls. There would have to be a monopoly of foreign trade established. Otherwise, um, we would be completely sabotaged uh, as the working class under those uh, circumstances. Now, of course, you've already indicated that none of the existing political parties would ever contemplate such a program. At best, we could hope that they would be forced into uh, socialist measures by a mass movement of the working class. So clearly the question of working class political representation, a working class political alternative, a workers' party is an integral, integral part of the Marxist Workers' Party's uh, perspective. Uh, absolutely. And I think maybe the first place to start is that the necessity for political representation uh, is something that confronts the two main classes within society at this point in time. And if you look at the main bourgeois parties, the ANC is a unity of the best of enemies at this particular point in time, in reality. The two factions do not have an unchallenged grip uh, on the party and are constantly at war with each other. With the, it is like watching an arm wrestling match with the, uh, uh, the one faction having the upper hand at one point and then there's a swing the other way by the other faction. Both of them equally corrupt, by the way, uh, equally committed to capitalism, uh, but differing from each other only in relation to the kind of methods by which the country should be uh, should be run and the place in that of all the traditional institutions of capitalism. But they are simply different faces of the same economic uh, order. The, the Democratic Alliance is in disarray, uh, a party that has basically from the very onset based itself on the fear, fears, particularly of the, the middle class, about uh, a loss of the of the privileges uh, in relation to the whites, the crumbs in relation to the colors uh, that they've enjoyed uh, in the past, or well, not enjoyed in the past, that were thrown in their direction as part of the strategy of the divide and rule of the capitalist class. That is what the DA's ambitions were in reality limited to. They got carried away by their own propaganda, by the rise in, the, uh, in their vote in previous elections, uh, and attempted the insulting uh, method of uh, crowning a black leader in the expectation that black voters would follow like sheep simply because the party had a black leader, when in fact the issue was what this party stands for in class terms. And it is uh, a party as committed, as committed to capitalism as the ANC itself is, and therefore offers no alternative. And to the extent that it has run up into these uh, problems, that is what it is a reflection of in the final analysis, that they, are, they offer no alternative to an overwhelmingly working class uh, population inside the country. We also see the EFF um, having dressed itself up in socialist uh, rhetoric, 
beginning to exhibit the first signs of internal friction within the leadership, between the leadership at the top and its student uh, following. And more importantly, the fact that the long arm of the law is catching up with the corruption uh, that has uh, dogged the ANC leadership, I mean the EFF leadership, even before in reality the EFF was born. And that in itself places an extreme limitation on its electoral prospects uh, uh, in the future. It has benefited mainly from the fact that uh, ANC traditional voters voted for it to punish the ANC and not out of any conviction for what the EFF itself stands for. And most importantly, it has had very, very limited appeal to the organized workers in this country throughout the period of its existence. In other words, there is a vacuum on the political plane, and that vacuum is uh, on the left of the political spectrum. Now, there has always been within the working class, even right from the beginning, or even before the formal coming into being of the tripartite alliance, a desire on the part of the working class for its own party, representing its own class interests independently. Famously, at the 1993 Congress, a year before the 1994 elections, a resolution was moved by the then uh, Secretary General of NUMSA, Moses Maikiso, for the establishment of a workers' party. That resolution was defeated, but the idea uh, receded, but never disappeared. By 1998, Kosatu conducted a survey amongst its own members, and fully 30% of them voted in that survey for Kosatu to establish a workers' party to challenge the ANC in the elections. There was, in that sense, always a healthy class distrust of the ANC amongst the uh, organized workers. By 2010, when that same survey, outsourced this time by Kosatu to uh, Tabo Mbeki's uh, brother, Mueletsi Mbeki, the figure, even though the survey was completed before the Marikana, Marikana massacre, found that 67% of Kosatu members were in favour of the work, of a workers' party. Safdu's Central Executive Committee meeting in November declared that, and I quote, a conference of the left, conference on socialism, must be convened to develop a minimum programme that can serve as a unity platform for the formation of a workers' party. Only the broadest possible unity of the left forces united behind a common programme can tilt the national balance of forces for fundamental transformation of society. They then went on to say, Safdu, once all the discussions have been concluded about the modalities and the platform through a bottom-up and democratic process, will catalyse the formation of a workers' party. Now, what position does the Marxist Workers' Party take towards these important developments? Well, to begin with, I think, uh, obviously, uh, any serious uh, socialist uh, is fully in favour of left unity and, and, and so forth. But we believe that this particular resolution uh, in the name of unity of the left is actually a retreat from the tasks that were placed before the Saftu leadership and all the forces that gathered at the working class summit that was called in July 2018, where a resolution was adopted for the creation of a mass workers party on a socialist program. That, from the standpoint of the Marxist workers party, represented the most favorable conditions for the creation of such a party because the forces that were brought together at that summit, uh, over a thousand delegates, 147 uh, community organizations, uh, the organized labor movement uh, in the form of the affiliates of SAFTU, as well as some student formations, brought together the main forces of struggle in, uh, currently playing itself out in the three main theatres of struggle, the workplace, the communities, and the education sector. Um, the approach that should be taken, in our view, of such a conference is how to contribute towards the implementation of the resolution that was adopted by the Working Class Summit, and not to replace that resolution. 
because the problem facing the working class is not the division amongst the small left forces of the different political formations that exist inside the country, but the fact that the energies of the masses are not harnessed together across and within the three different uh, theatres of struggle. And that can best be done under the leadership of the organised working class uh, through the implementation of the resolution that was adopted at the Working Class Summit. So we will participate uh, in that uh, conference for the purposes of uh, uh, campaigning for uh, unity behind the establishment of a mass workers' party on a socialist program through the implementation of the resolution of the Working Class Summit. We note that Software has uh, committed itself at the Central Committee meeting to convening the Working Class Summit, and that, uh, from the standpoint of the Marxist uh, Workers' Party, is by far the most important political gathering, given the political and economic crisis coming together in the form of a perfect storm inside the country that is required in order to take uh, the struggle of the working class forward. The manner in which 2019 was concluded should be interpreted if we look at the actions of the ANC government and its capitalist backers. Uh, a call to battle um, against the working class of this country. It should be interpreted as a declaration of war. And this battle must be fought simultaneously on the economic as on the political plane. Whilst we mobilize all our forces, utilizing the tactic of the United Front uh, to achieve through that tactic the greatest possible unity of the working class, we also need simultaneously a clarity of purpose in the form of a platform that can unite the working class, but also points the whole of society to the future. In its early days, Kosatu, with barely a million members, was looked to because of the uh, uh, unapologetic commitment to socialism that was a feature of the outlook of the advanced layer of the working class organizing Kosatu at that time. Kosatu was looked to almost like a political party as an alternative. We are not, of course, saying that Saftu must convert itself into a political party. We are saying the forces that were gathered at the working class summit provide the, uh, the forces necessary for, to, to create such a party. We are moving forward at this time, at a time internationally, when the working class itself, um, as we indicated at the beginning, of this uh, discussion, uh, increasingly coming to the realization that the question of the future of the world economy, in fact, of the, of the planet itself, uh, is at stake here. And it is a question of which class must rule society, the capitalist class or the working class. The capitalist class has proven itself to be historically obsolete, but also to the danger, to be a danger, a clear and present danger to the future of humanity and uh, of the globe itself, and let the working class take the future of society into its own hands. If you agree with what you have heard today, we encourage you to join us and join the struggle to win the working class and its organizations to a clear and principled Marxist program. Visit our website at marxistworkersparty.org.za. 